Well, good afternoon to most of you and good morning to those of you here in Avalon and uh, the West Coast. My name is Julie Perlin Lee. I'm the executive director of Catalina Island Museum and I've been waiting for this day for a while. So welcome to the 100 year celebration of Cubs spring training on Catalina Island. We're thrilled that you're with us. Um, Kelly Costello is going to be the moderator for today's program. And, and it's a good one. So I would just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. And I want to just take this moment to let you know that we have been um, presented with a unique opportunity uh, to um, have an opportunity to purchase an important collection for the Catalina Island Museum. And it's come up very, a little bit urgently. So I'm trying to get the word out. Uh, and so thank you for listening in for a moment. So those of you who are familiar with Catalina Island know that we had a very famous Chinese sailing junk that um, has its final resting home here on Catalina Island. And the museum here, we have the largest collection of artifacts from that sailing junk. We've been presented with the opportunity to buy some important collections from it. And uh, so next Saturday, we're putting together a program about the Ningpo, the famous and telling you about the collection. And we've also brought in a distinguished, link, uh, excuse me, a distinguished lecturer. Um, his name is Hans von Tilburg and he's a maritime archeologist. So I hope you'll join us next Saturday, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, correct Kelly? Right, and uh, to really learn more about the history of the Ningpo, it's gonna be a program and the collection that we have an opportunity to buy. So with that, let's play some ball. Hello everyone, I'm Kelly Costello, Programs and Events Coordinator here at the Catalina Island Museum. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your Sunday with us while we celebrate such a historical milestone. Uh, today is the 100th anniversary uh, of the Chicago Cubs spring training in Avalon. On February 28th, 1921, the Chicago Cubs arrived on Catalina Island for their first of a span of 30 years for spring training. We have invited dear friend to the museum back as our very special guest speaker. Some of you may remember him from when he visited the island back in March, 2019 to speak during one of our first Friday events. Uh, the folks that traveled with CIM to Chicago were lucky enough to get a VIP treatment and tour of the Wrigley Field from him. He is a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan. He has been sought after for his knowledge of Wrigley Field by both authors and media outlets from George Will to CNN Radio and Sports Illustrated. Uh, a Wrigley Field tour guide since 1998, he has extensive background in baseball research with an emphasis on ballparks. For his service to the team in 1998, he was awarded a 2016 front office World Series ring by the Chicago Cubs National League Club, which was given to him with the team in April, 2017. Uh, coming to you virtually, all the way from Chicago, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Brian Bernadoni. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me back uh, to, uh, to Catalina Island. It's a fabulous place. And what I'd like to do uh, in order to get things going is to start right away. And here we go. As you can see from... Um, First off, again, thank you everyone for having me back to Catalina Island. Uh, frankly, I wish I was out there uh, right now in Chicago. It is a foggy 50 degrees. We had about three feet of snow in the last few weeks, which is a good reason why you can understand why spring training or preparing for a baseball season is never done uh, up here in the northern states. What you're looking at here is a, a great picture of essentially what spring training looked like on Catalina Island. Uh, that's Jolly Charlie Grimm hanging out on the beach here at Catalina Island. I call this fun in the sun starting in 1921. Um, for everyone who's made a contribution today, thank you for supporting the Catalina Island Museum. Um, I think I can say, say it strongly on behalf of the staff that Catalina Island uh, Museum does tremendous things. If you've never been to Cat Catalina Island, it is a must stop. It's incredibly important to memorialize 
the history of what Catalina, Catalina Island um, has meant not only to uh, the Chicago Cubs, but also to Los Angeles and to the culture of Southern California. It's a fabulous place and it's a wonderful part of the legacy of what is the Wrigley family in Catalina. Um, I think my background was mentioned. Uh, I want to, I, I can't even begin to start to think uh, what the Cubs organization has done for me since I've been part of that organization in 1998. No person was more shocked on the planet earth than I was when I was given a World Series ring as uh, part of the organization. Um, one of the other things that I'm very proud of that we worked on was putting a historic marker where the West Side Grounds took place. And I'll show how all of these things link together. And one of the odd things I'm sharing with you about my background is I'm a member of the Emil Verbin Memorial Society, which is the Washington DC Chicago Cubs Hall of Fame. There is a Catalina Island linkage to that as well, which we'll share. Any discussion about spring training really has to start with a brief history of spring training in and of itself. And I wanna start with a discussion really of how spring training came to be. For the Chicago Cubs, it started back, it started with trips to New Orleans and now it goes to Mesa. So let's walk a little bit through that history. So how did we get to the concept of spring training? Why is there a spring training? Well, if you take a look at the picture I'm sharing with you right now, that is an overhead view of Wrigley Field. Pretty good reason why we have spring training. Um, there's snow everywhere here in Chicago. And the whole idea was initially starting back in the beginning of organized baseball was to provide preliminary workouts to give players an opportunity to get ready. Uh, right now, there are, uh, they're playing baseball in Mesa and the Toronto Blue Jays are playing the New York Yankees. Vladimir Guerrero, for example, last year was 40 pounds heavier than he is this year. Part of it was getting these guys back in shape. For teams like the Chicago Cubs, or at that time, the Chicago White Stockings, that meant taking trips to where it was warmer. And the Chicago Cubs and the Cincinnati Reds were some of the very, very first teams to actually engage in spring training with trips down to New Orleans as, as, as early as April of 1870. You're gonna hear me say an awful lot, the Cubs were the first, the Cubs were the first, the Cubs were the first. There's a good reason for that. The Chicago Cubs or its predecessor, the Chicago White Stockings are the oldest team in organized baseball. They're the longest lasting existing team in baseball. So a lot of traditions we hold near and dear in baseball, they do start with the Chicago Cubs. Now, the idea of these preliminary workouts or Southern tours was fundamental to getting baseball going, but they really became organized training camps by the mid-1880s. Walking you through what the Cubs actually did, they started with trips to New Orleans. They went to Hot Springs, Arkansas, Champaign, Illinois, which is the home of the University of Illinois of Chicago. University of Illinois, and actually they took trains out to Los Angeles, but that lasted only for a couple seasons. They went to Santa Monica, they went to New Orleans, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and then Hot Springs, Arkansas. Lots of trips and obviously not permanent places. Cubs finally started looking at more permanent locations. In 1913, the Chicago Cubs were actually able to, preserve, to persuade the business community of Tampa to cover all the expenses for the Cubs to come to spring training. They would stay there through the 1916 season. So what that meant was Charles Murphy, who was the head of the Cubs at the time, actually convinced Tampa Bay business people to give up about $5,000. That's all it was, $5,000 to cover the Chicago Cubs from going from Chicago down to Tampa to cover those expenses. Those business people cobbled their money together and were the first ones to really get the idea that we can make some money off of spring training. Incidentally, the piece of uh, the artifact I'm showing you actually comes from Charlie Wiegman, who was the owner of the Chicago Federals before they became the Chicago Cubs. He actually was quite familiar with Tampa uh, but he took his Chicago Federals and Wales of the Federal League to Shreveport, Los, uh, Louisiana in 1914 and 1915. The piece I'm showing you is actually a menu from the first spring training trip that they took down there. So these, 
started to become more permanent and more professional uh, type trips. Cubs uh, went from Tampa to Pasadena, California from 1917 to 1921. The picture I'm showing you there is actually the Wrigley Mansion in Pasadena. For those of you from Pasadena, you well would know that as the uh, Tournament of Roses location. So that is the location where the headquarters is for the Tournament of Roses or the Rose Bowl Parade. This was an important thing because during that 1917 to 1921 uh, period of time, this is the acquisition period uh, from Charlie Wiegman to the Wrigley family. The trends of spring training had substantively changed. Um, for the Chicago Cubs, the idea really uh, fostered under Johnny Evers, who became one of the advocates for moving from exhibition tours to warm weather states to build permanent training camps. Usually what was happening were Cub players were traveling on trains looking for basically pickup games across the southern country, uh, southern parts of the country in order to establish themselves as uh, and prepare themselves for playing a full season. The idea became very strong. Let's build a permanent training camp. What this move would really allow for is it will allow for the organizations to use winners to train and most importantly to evaluate uh, draftees and existing players. I show you this picture of Frank Chance, the peerless leader, just to show you what baseball in essence looked like during that time period, from the uniform styles to the ballpark styles that were happening as these permanent decisions were taking place. This is a picture of the West Side Grounds. The West Side Grounds is where the Chicago Cubs were during, uh, during those early parts of um, its highest reign of baseball up until this current day. This is located in Chicago's near west side. Uh, you'll see it as a tiered ballpark, basically uh, postage stamped into a neighborhood. Um, for those of you who do visit Chicago, it's, uh, there's a permanent marker in the medical center uh, that, that has been placed there. It's where the Cubs had some tremendous years, including its back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back World Series runs from 1906, 1907, and 1908. Um, I participated and was one of the people in directing the dedication of the West Side Grounds project. I, you're going to hear me talk about the preservation of old ballparks, and I think, again, there's a great linkage between what happened in Chicago and what can happen out in Catalina. This is a picture of the Federal League Park, which became Wiegman Park, which became Cubs Park, which became Wrigley Field. This is the ballpark the Cubs were playing on as they were making their decision to come to Catalina. Ballpark was built in 1914 with major expansions in the ballpark uh, starting from the early 1920s uh, through the 1930s into the 1980s to the considerable work that the, Wrigley, uh, the Ricketts family did uh, upon their acquisition of the ballpark uh, 2007, 8, and 2015 and beyond. Uh, I like to say as being part of that organization since 1998, uh, that it's rare that you don't see a major renovation or a major project taking place somewhere around the ballpark um, or in the ballpark itself, which goes to its standing power that it has lasted that long because of the constant work, upgrades, and maintenance that's happened to the ballpark. These are pictures of the early ballpark as it was being developed and are indicative of the, of the the ballpark as William Wrigley got the ballpark back in uh, in the early 1920s. This is William Wrigley himself, and it's always intimidating talking about William Wrigley when you're talking to a group of people from Catalina because he was just so omnipresent, not only um, in Chicago, but clearly in Catalina itself. So let's talk about William Wrigley uh, and talk about what that man actually meant uh, to the Cubs and also to Catalina. William Wrigley was a soap and baking soda salesman. And what he basically uh, came up with is was this idea to use banana flavored chewing gum as a premium for his clients. Soon that chewing gum actually became more popular than the soap. So for those of you who wonder what was that gum, what was that flavor of gum, I've got to try that gum in order to know what it was. Well, go to your local store and get yourself some juicy fruit. It was juicy fruit that was the actual gum that made him so popular. 
This was a gentleman who was an advocate for no advertising in the ballpark, but advertising was a core part of his background in the form of the Doubleman twins, were, which were actually on the center field scoreboard at Wrigley Field back in 1923. You never called Wrigley Field, you never called Wrigley Field a stadium, William Wrigley. Uh, it was always a park. Uh, it was fan friendly. He demanded that the ballpark be cleaned daily. And he's very good in paying his players. Should be noted, this tradition has extended well beyond William Wrigley, PK Wrigley, Tribune to the Ricketts family ownership. That ballpark is cleaned on a daily basis. You will not find a ballpark in organized baseball in any of the professional ranks that is babied as much as Wrigley Field. And that's a tradition and a throwback to William Wrigley himself. Wrigley died in 1932, and he gave control of the team to PK, who made a deathbed oath never to sell, and PK Wrigley never did. I show this picture of what the Wrigley footprint, in a very small sense, looks like in Chicago. That is the Wrigley building downtown. Um, on the bottom right, you see a picture of the Wrigley Mansion, which is in Lakeview, and of course, Wrigley Field itself with some of the beautification that the Wrigley Ricketts family did in preparation for the centennial. I have to say as a moment of, of personal privilege that I thought William Wrigley belonged to us in Chicago. You look at the footprint that William Wrigley created and just the Goliath of, of impact that he made, we thought he was just ours until I went to Catalina Island myself a couple years ago. We are kind of the second family to what he did in Catalina. But this is where his lasting legacy was. This was the chewing gum factory in Chicago. I mentioned this because if you look to the left-hand side of this picture, you see uh, what looks to be about a five or six story building. That building still exists. For those of you in Chicago, it's off of uh, Grand Avenue and it's actually the home of where the Salvation Army is in Chicago. Uh, Salvation Army uses that facility in particular as a sorting room for contributions. Um, that is a, still a linkage to Chicago that that building has in town. I want to talk about how the, what the Chicago Cubs looked like under William Wrigley Jr. This is the masthead that they had for their stationery at the ballpark. But in order to get to Wrigley, you had to talk about the owners of the Cubs before William Wrigley. William Hulbert was the uh, founder of the National League. He owned it, gave it to the sporting, sporting goods magnate, Albert Spaulding. Spaulding then turned it over to Jim Hart, who turned it over to Charles Murphy, who bought the Cubs from Hart for $125,000. That went on to the Taft family. The Taft family of Ohio actually owned two ball clubs. They owned the Cincinnati Reds and the Chicago Cubs finally decided to get rid of the Chicago Cubs to a guy by the name of Charlie Wigman, who bought the team uh, for $503,500. That money was cobbled together with a group of restaurateurs and other groups, including a chewing gum salesman by the name of William Wrigley. So Wrigley is part of that group that buys the Chicago Cubs for $503,500. But the guy who was really underneath it that pushed Wrigley to buy it was a guy by the name of Albert Lasker. Lasker uh, was, was the man who also convinced Wrigley to name the ballpark Wrigley Field, not after Wrigley Field, Wrigley himself, but after his chewing gum projects. So as we all complain about corporate names of ballparks and that ballparks have lost that, that, that neighborhood identity, the fact of the matter is Wrigley Field is named after the chewing gum, not the individual. Corporate naming and sponsorship goes back to William Wrigley as well. Lasker, however, because of the times that it was, Lasker uh, would have been really noted as one of the first Jewish owners of a baseball team, but Lasker actually stayed behind the uh, the scenes to make it look like actually Wrigley was the main owner of the team. Wrigley, uh, Wrigley would announce that in 1925 that he, uh, that Lasker was actually the owner, but Wrigley took full control of the team uh, by 1925. On the face though, Wrigley saw that Wigman was having significant financial difficulties after the 1918 World Series. And these times of 1918 mirror what's happening right now in baseball. 
Wiegman was a restaurateur in Chicago during the great Spanish flu pandemic. He started hemorrhaging money because he was a restaurateur and because he also ran a movie theater, billiard halls, as well as the ballpark. In order for him to make up for his losses, he started selling Cub stock, which went over to William Wrigley. By 1920, Wiegman Park became Cubs Park. 1921, spring training starts in Catalina Island. Wrigley would then expand his ballpark in 22 and 23. He would start construction of the upper decks in 26 and 27. And as we're going through all the success, then William Wrigley dies in 1932. But under Wrigley, the Chicago Cubs were one of the most dominant teams, not only in the baseball world, but in athletics themselves. If you look over the history of baseball, the Cubs were the dominant team from the 1870s all the way almost up into that 1930s period. Cubs are now in a new period of dominance where we're doing extraordinarily well in the National League if you look at the spans of teams. But the dominance that was happening in that time period was unprecedented. They were a juggernaut. They were in the World Series in 1906, 07, and 08, winning in 07 and 08. They appeared in World Series again in 1910 and 1918. When Wrigley acquires the team in 1918 and takes full control, they go off into a higher level altogether. In the Catalina years, which is what we're here to talk about, they made appearances in the World Series in 1929, 1932, 35, and 38. It's important to note that the Wrigley family did pretty good on their investment. They sold the team to the Tribune uh, for a price tag of $20.5 million in 1981. And then Tom Ricketts would buy the Cubs from the Tribune in 2009 for $845 million. To put that, uh, that investment based on, on reports from Forbes and others has doubled during the tenure of the Ricketts family in owning the ball club. So baseball is a very, uh, very lucrative business. And the valuations uh, and how baseball has, has changed over time um, shows what that investment actually looks like. What we're talking about when we talk about Catalina Island in order to really frame this is this is the golden era of the Chicago Cubs. Um, but we wanna talk about Catalina Island here as well. This is Cata Catalina Island. What I am looking at right here, this overhead picture is actually more knowledge in that one picture about Catalina Island did than when William Wrigley bought the island. Wrigley bought the island site on scene. But this is how the island looked from the bay, uh, from overhead with, uh, and it's just a stark, beautiful natural resource. So this is the Catalina that Wrigley bought, site again unseen. Wrigley had a love for Catalina Island. This picture is actually from a book, uh, a book in Chicago that talks about uh, Wrigley and his desire for Catalina um, from which he came. This is, this is a person who wanted to grow old on Catalina Island. This is a book that was published in Chicago about William Wrigley. And was he talking about his chewing gum? Was he talking about any of the other stuff? No, the caricature was Catalina Island. That's how much he was passionate about California. He obtained the island in 1919 from the Banning family, and he decided to devote himself to the preservation and promotion of the island. Uh, he built a home on, on Mount Ada, which he named the mountain after his wife. Now, there were indigenous people on Catalina Island before all this, uh, but I guess when you buy the island, you get to name things after yourself. So he decided to name it after his wife. He then bought the SS Virginia and renamed it the Avalon. He built a, a dance pavilion for tourism, uh, the Sugarloaf Casino. But again, in 1921, he began spring, uh, spring training for the Cubs until 1951, excluding the Warriors in 1942 and 1945. Oh, let's go. Right there. Let's do it the right way here. So what happened here? Going backwards. There we go. There we go. So, how did why did why did Wrigley decide to move the ball club to Catalina for spring training? 
At Wrigley's direction, Johnny Evers, who was the manager of the team, decided to bring the pitchers and catchers out uh, out to Catalina to check it out, to basically scout it out to decide if this island would be a good location for spring training. Evers and the team took a look, and the pitchers and catchers specifically thought the island was a great location. Remember, they were in Los Angeles at the time. Thought it was a great idea. It had a relatively new hotel, the Hotel St. Catherine. Uh, it had, been, had just been built back in 1917. And Wrigley started looking at the linkage of what this could do for a possible tourism haven that he could create. He understood this better than anything. And remember, the Wrigleys were some of the greatest marketers in the world. Baseball brought reporters, which wrote stories and took pictures, and it created an allure about the island, which would bring tourism. Wrigley had a very romantic notion about what baseball would actually mean. He thought that baseball players typified the full-blooded Americanism. He admired ball players because they go after what they want and they get it. Um, he thought that fans were a great foundation of the American uh, citizen, uh, citizenship. He loved the enthusiasm of watching fans watch the game. But I love this quote that I found. And this was, uh, I want to thank the staff at Catalina Island for uh, giving me access to some of their archives. I can't wait to go back to really dig deeper in it. If your liver is sluggish, and I, I just wonder if, Baseball executives today would go with this, this line. If, if, if your liver is sluggish, I've never felt my liver be sluggish in my life, but if your liver is sluggish and your blood is slow, take in a baseball game um, because a two-bit seat on the bleachers will give you $2 worth of pep. Um, it, it's really amazing that that kind of, um, I, I think you can use the word boosterism, really got people going. They, they really bought into what anything that Wrigley was selling and, and folks at Catalina did as well. Avalon Bay. So this is again, a, a great view of where, uh, of what the ball players would start to see. And we're gonna start taking it away from Rig the discussion away from Wrigley Field and more to where the ball player experiences were. This is the blueprint, and I, I believe you can find this at the museum at Avalon. And I, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it in front of all all of you that are there. I desperately want to get a copy of this to give to the Cubs. I want to show the Cubs exactly what this spring training look, location looked like. But this is a wonderful photograph of Wrigley Field on Avalon. And what I have found in my research in going through this is this is actually the first Wrigley Field. This Wrigley Field predates the Wrigley Field that was in Los Angeles, California, which predates the naming of Wrigley Field in Chicago, which makes me so passionate about wanting to see what we can do to preserve this wonderful, great location here. The configurations of this ballpark were done to replicate the dimensions of Cubs Park in Chicago. One of the Numerous things that the Ricketts family did that they did so well upon taking over the ballpark is not only what they did for the ballpark in Chicago, but what also they did at Sloan Park in, in, in Mesa, where they replicated the dimensions of the ballpark. Avalon did that. It replicated the dimensions of Cubs Park in Chicago. The layout and design was done by Bobby Doerr, who was the groundskeeper for the Chicago Cubs at Cubs Park, who also leveled the ground and rolled it. Now, this is interesting. They originally had developed ideas for stands for a thousand, but it was originally planned to expand almost immediately to uh, stands to go up to 2,500. And Wrigley actually had goals of taking Avalon in the Wrigley Field at Avalon to have it sit 10,000 people. Now, I've walked that site. That would be something to see 10,000 people on that site. And that never came to pass. But what did come to pass was the development of 30 bungalots to house players uh, and their families if, if they wanted to around the ballpark. They were small 10 by 24, uh, uh, 10 by 24 units. Um, this trend of these bungalots is actually being done in minor league baseball parks across the country where some ball teams are actually building housing for players uh, because in, in the minor league system, a lot of ball players will actually be adopted by families, believe it or not. 
And this would, uh, some of the ball teams are, are trying to build culture and basically constructing uh, affordable housing for them. The original uh, practices for the Cubs was actually done on Pebbly, on Pebbly Beach. Um, construction of the field began in 1921, but until 1928, players would actually change in their, in their bungalows and then walk to the ballpark until the adjacent clubhouse off your golf course was put into effect. This is an important thing for you to remember as we talk about, uh, about uh, the Chicago Cubs and Catalina. The team's home games, the scrimmages, were free of charge. The only things that I've seen free of charge in any professional sport at this range um, for any kind of training is actually Chicago Bears training camp, which they'll allow you to see for scrimmages for free, but the actual games themselves are part of any kind of pregame package. The team's home games were free. So what that tells me is the Wrigley's weren't into this for a financial thing, and rather they were into it for marketing of the island. The games were broadcast starting in 1927 uh, on KFWO. This is Wrigley Field in Los Angeles. I share this picture with you because it has a great linkage to Wrigley Field in Chicago in that the architect who designed it is the same architect. And that man was Zachary Taylor Davis, who's known, and this is not me, as the Frank Lloyd Wright of baseball. He designed Wrigley Field in Chicago, designed Wrigley Field in Los Angeles, and for those of you on Avalon, he designed the Wrigley Mansion in Avalon. He also designed Comiskey Park in Chicago and was also involved in the designs of the original Yankee Stadium and also of the Polo Grounds. So he was he was integral in the discussion. And for those of you trying to figure out who is Zachary Taylor Davis, it's Zachary Taylor Davis is the gentleman with the hat on the right. This is beautiful Wrigley Field in Chicago. Um, this is uh, uh, the season after Ernie Banks passed. This is what Wrigley Field initially was going to look like. These are, uh, this is a photograph of what the uh, actual design would look like for the ballpark itself. Uh, and this is, uh, at the time, the ballpark would be a single stand, uh, a single a single stand ballpark. Later, later blueprints showed what a double deck would look like, but this is a single stand ballpark. This is Comiskey Park, uh, the baseball palace of the world also designed by Zachary Taylor Davis. And this is what the original design elements looked like for uh, Comiskey Park. Catalina Island Spring Training does not look like either of these ballparks. This was a rudimentary ballpark with rudimentary stands carved into the valley here. Uh, one of the things that you see the beginning elements of in this early postcard is the eucalyptus trees that uh, Wrigley had planted on the third base line. Again, the, the field itself was rolled and leveled by Bobby Doerr. And it's important to note, the configurations were to be of Cubs Park in Chicago. Here's a great uh, view of the valley itself. And you'll note that there is no outfield wall. So if a player were to actually hit it out into that beach-like area, that would be considered a, a at that part, a home run, but baseball rules would actually say that the ball's in play. More pictures of the stands themselves. These paintings, uh, these postcards are, are actually paintings of photographs of the ballpark during these time periods. Uh, most of these postcards are from my, my, my own personal collection, um, but I think you can uh, see copies of these at the museum themselves. Kelly can nod if she agrees with me on that. What's notable uh, about the training field at the Chicago, for the Chicago Cubs at Santa Catalina Island or at Santa Catalina is it's the and it's something that you see in all major league ballparks now is the first portable backstop was developed at at uh, Santa Catalina Island um, at, at 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 Cubs Park or Wrigley Field depending on on the era. Um, this was basically done because no one wanted to chase the ball. It was actually done simply because of that. It wasn't done as a, a backstop or anything important. It was actually done. No one wanted to chase the ball, and they thought that we would have a portable ability to do it. Now you see them across Major League Baseball and college and high school as well. 
When you got to the island, one of the things that they really pushed, and this again leads me to think that there was an awful lot of marketing that was done by Wrigley in order to create a flow for it, was uh, it was an island with an awful lot to do. This picture is very reminiscent of the work of the Shepherd family, um, but it shows that if you came to the ballpark, if you came to Catalina Island, there were lots of offerings. Uh, on the bottom of the offerings you see, and you may not be able to see it on your screen real well, but they also featured girls softball and men's baseball at Cubs Park. But this was well after spring training was over. Uh, you could also do a weenie roast over at Pebbly Beach if you wanted to, just make sure you got a permit. Um, but you could, there were sing-alongs you could do. Um, there were all there was quail hunting. There was a whole series of things uh, that you could do on the island, just like you can today. This, this marketing piece on the inside actually had songs. If you can imagine two pages of songs that were sung for the sing-alongs that were done every night on Catalina Island. What's an interesting feature of all this is there's no chamber marketing markings on this, but this was clearly part of the chamber's efforts to, uh, again, market the ballpark. But one of the things that made it exciting for Wrigley was this was an island with locks to do, and it was a great draw for the players as well. He also had good lodging for the players. Now, as I had mentioned, he had built 30, uh, 30, 30 housing units out on the island, but this is a po pictures of where the Cubs originally stayed, which is the Hotel St. Catherine. Um, that, that building was demolished, uh, I think, about 50 years ago, but um, – this showed that the Cubs were not suffering as far as their lodging went. I would remind folks, though, that um, the players would change in full uniform until 1927 from their hotels or their bungalows to the playing field itself. Wrigley didn't suffer when he would come to Avalon. Uh, Zachary Taylor Davis, the architect of Wrigley Field, Comiskey Park, and others, designed an L-shaped mansion around a formal court entry on the mountainside and there was also a staircase of over a hundred stairs leading up to the house uh, from the ocean side. His home, which is now a bed and breakfast, he had three stories, a Turkish bath, a billiard room, organ chamber, refrigerated, uh, a refrigerator or freezer room, six bedrooms and an elegant terrace porch. But the best feature and what really loved about it was you could watch the Cubs practice from his mansion office. And if you were a player who was not playing to your expectations, you would be called up by a megaphone up to the top of the island to go speak to Mr. Wrigley about why you were kicking the ball around. Uh, the ball, this land clearly evolved over years with more landscaping. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful view, 350 feet above the ocean. The Wrigley's uh, came to the island about twice a year um, for trips that lasted before and between four and 10 weeks. Um, there were guests, including a couple presidents that actually stayed with the Wrigley family, including Herbert Hoover, Calvin Coolidge. To my knowledge, there have been four presidents that have, have come to the island. Uh, one prime minister of England, that would be William, Tr I mean, uh, uh, would be Churchill, as well as the Prince of Wales. Hoover would have made the cut, uh, not Hoover, but um, Warren, Warren Harding would have made the cut, but Warren Harding died before he could get to Catalina Island. Um, there's a great linkage between the Lasker family, who was the political consultant to Warren Harding uh, and, and Wrigley as well. This is the view from Catalina Island from the, Wrigley, from the Wrigley Mansion itself, showing the viewpoint that Wrigley would have had not only of the island, but really getting out to the baseball field himself from his study. And there is the double arrow or the spearmint gum that Wrigley, uh, Wrigley would have, uh, that made Wrigley famous. Um, if you go up to that bed and breakfast, they do feature Wrigley chewing gum up, up on the top, as they should. Little moment of requiem here that Zachary Taylor Davis, I think is one of the people that's often forgotten in, in, in discussions about Wrigley Field itself. What I would share with you is the Ricketts family have, have done a good job of reestablishing the importance of Zachary Taylor Davis. The hotel across the street from Wrigley Field is known as the Hotel Zachary. Um, but uh, Zachary Taylor Davis's footprint is, um, as a design element is just as important in, in, um, in Wrigley history as anyone's could be. Um, I think uh, he's right up there with your own um, 
design people that you had on the island himself. Some really tremendous people added to the Wrigley legacy. William Wrigley dies, he passes it on to P.K. Wrigley. P.K. Wrigley cared very little about baseball, but he knew the value of advertising. It was, it was Wrigley himself who talked about fun and sun at beautiful Wrigley Field. And he always wanted to test the marketing and how Wrigley would do that is he would track out-of-state license plates in Cub parking lots to see how far the appeal of the team was by radio. Um, he didn't really care about the performance on the field. Uh, he was more concerned about getting attendance in the ballpark. And how did you do that? You marketed the ballpark. He pushed for the ballpark to be painted, got rid of sidewalk vendors around the ballpark, created, um, accentuated things like ladies stay at the ballpark and giving things out, again, to bring people into the ballpark. And as most people will note, he was opposed to lights generally. He made great contributions to Wrigley. Uh, established the permanent bleachers and the and the scoreboard. He tilted the seats at a 30 degree angle so fans would have great sight lines for the ballpark. After his renovation was all over, um, he worked on the ivy and the redo of the upper deck. For Catalina, though, it's a massive contribution. He received control of Catalina in 1932 and then improved infrastructure in Avalon. But in 1975, the Wrigley family, who had total control of the island, deeded 42,000 acres to the Catalina Island Conservancy, which was established in 1972, really, really keeping Catalina the way that you guys have maintained it over the years. It's, it's such a selfless contribution and an a, a incredible one for science and academia. Now we can finally get, now that you've got all that backdrop, we can talk about the Cubs of Catalina Island. Every picture, and I want to—I I cannot talk any more about this without talking about the incredible work that Jim Vitti has done. There's uh, a couple different publications. I believe you can find both of these books over at Catalina Island Museum. But but Jim Vitti has done a great service just by preserving the photos of what it looked like at Catalina. It's really difficult to piece together a lot of the story because across baseball, you don't find a lot of books. And in fact, it's a great hint to myself. You know, I've got probably two or three books in me yet to write, but this one, a, a, a book talking about spring training in and of itself is important because spring training is kind of thought about as practice. It's an assumption. It's not a real thing, but Catalina really makes the argument there was a lot more to it than that. The pictures of Catalina are really challenging. Um, you'll see some, uh, a lot of pictures of players running in uniform in beautiful viewpoints. But it also indicates to me that Wrigley loved just the idea or the juxtaposition or the farce of having ballplayers in strictly Catalina Island experiences. There was a bird preserve on Catalina Island, which is why you see cup players with ostriches. Not a lot of, that doesn't look like a serious workout to me. Originally, when Wrigley came to the island, he thought that we were gonna do workouts on Pebbly Beach but what was happening was the players were getting too much sand in their spikes. As a result, they had to build another uh, another place for the players to go. Incidentally, there was a little there was a, 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 a Catalina Island team that played on the island that had really claimed Pebbly Beach as well as their own, and it's this team. Uh, Catalina Island baseball team of 1907. These guys were called the, the Lulus. This is a photo from A.H. Rogers of California. This is the, uh, the first team that we could find that was organized on the island was established in 1900. Uh, you'll see abalone shells on the ground. This looks to be a fraternal organization. If anyone knows about this, I would ask you to reach out to Kelly and the staff over at the island to tell us more about this team or if anybody actually made it out of it. But the team played on Pebbly Beach, including against teams from Wilmington, who arrived by the steamer Cabrillo. Um, but this looks to be um, a mainstay for a little while, at least on the island. So uh, if people have information about a baseball team on Catalina prior to this, would love to know about it. The stands at Wrigley Field or Cubs Park were, again, very rudimentary. You'll notice that there were pegs on the uh, on the um, out on the on the walls here of the dugout, 
Um, if a player put their jacket there, it was not likely if there were fans in the ballpark that that jacket would stay there. Uh, so there were opportunities where things were left uh, that players that players left out there may not make it uh, make it back to the clubhouse with them. It's an interesting note in talking to folks from Catalina that a lot of things that the Cubs brought to Catalina ended up staying on the island, but that was on purpose. That the players uh, donated a lot of things to the to the uh, to kids on the island itself, um, and they didn't want to deal with the shipping issues. Let's put this on the table. Catalina loved the Cubs. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the and the folks in Catalina loved getting the Cubs on the island. Great public relations uh, uh, events were centered on when the Cubs would come to town. Um, these these are not small events. These are fun fun events where um, local local uh, locals could get involved. And it's very clear there was a lot of camaraderie. And again, you'll find this in both the Biddy books that there was a lot of camaraderie, not only between the Chicago Cubs and, and the locals, but also the Chicago Cubs and visitors to the island itself. Again, I go back to leisure though. Leisure and the marketing of Catalina Island. This is Roger Hornsby on a boat. This is not Roger Hornsby catching a ball or, 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 or managing. This is or hitting. This is Roger Hornsby fishing. Again, great promo pictures for people back home to see that would bring people to the allure of what is Catalina Island. More fun in the sun at the bird sanctuary. Again, folks with Charlie Grimm. These have got to be pictures of folks coming to and from the island, either before or after practice, taking a look. And having walked the island myself, many of these buildings, in fact, some of you that are locals, this may be your house. So <laughs> there are great pictures that still exist. The marketing worked. Um, this is a picture to your left of Bill Veck and William Wrigley with Kennesaw Mountain Landis. What's re really said is while Kennesaw Mountain Landis was visiting the island and you can see the glee of Veck and Wrigley of having baseball's first commissioner on the island, it was really Wrigley that was one of the masterminds with Lasker to bring Kennesaw Mountain Landis to that position. But that's one of the most notable VIP baseball guests that came to the island, other than the 15 Hall of Famers that played for the Cubs on that. Another rookie trying to make the team. Now, probably not, but that's Charlie McCarthy. And it's, it's, it's hard. when you see pictures like this, you have to have a frame of reference of knowing who the heck Charlie McCarthy was, but he was a, uh, he was a, man, a mannequin that was very popular in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, that, uh, that mannequin was part of a, a PR stunt uh, of, again, linking Hollywood to the Chicago Cubs and to spring training. Ball players on horses. Why not? That's part of spring training. Wrigley family. One of my favorite stories associated with the Wrigley family and transportation on the island is the notion that it was a three hour boat ride from Catalina on a steamer from, Lo from Long Beach to, to the island itself. So Wrigley decided to start uh, working towards bringing uh, airplanes out onto the island. And it's a, there's a, a famous story that's noted that uh, William Wrigley decided that he wanted to show off that he had, uh, was uh, providing an airport and, and a turnabout that would allow planes to land uh, land on the water roll onto a runway and then be turned around because there wasn't enough room on the airport line to turn it around and put them back out into the air again. Interestingly enough, PK Wrigley, the, the Roger Hornsby and, um, and some executives from Catalina Island were offered the opportunity to do it. William, Root, William Root, Wrigley looked at Hornsby who was one of his best players and said, Hornsby, don't get on that plane. Let PK and everyone else do it because you're too valuable. To what PK Wrigley looked at the others saying, "Wait, we're not value. We're not valuable at all." But Wrigley's going to keep his uh, top player in there. It's a funny story, just indicating that um, Wrigley did definitely have a preference for some of his ball players and looked like even over his own son. How would you get there if you were a Cub player? Well. Like everyone else, it's not like you drove to Los Angeles. You actually took a train 
These trains would leave from Union Station in Chicago. It was always a major press event. Players would commiserate, play cards, and have pickup players on the caravan all the way to Los Angeles and Long Beach. Again, uh, the marketing of this island was such a paramount thing. And it's so great that you have a place like the Catalina Island Museum that preserved a lot of these pieces. But you'll see that um, the marketing of the island actually really relied on the two boats, the Avalon and, and the Catalina, in, the SS Catalina, in order to bring people to and fro. Essentially, Wrigley built an armada. When he bought the island, he was able to purchase a couple steamships, rename them, and use them. These steamships would deliver passengers to Catalina for many, many years, establishing Avalon. And it was also, because the port was such, was able to have the Cubs use the island, and it also drew the attention of the U.S. military during the war years. Again, more pictures of Catalina, the SS Catalina and the SS Avalon coming to port. Uh, these pictures are from um, the Water and Air Group out of Los Angeles that really have done a, an amazing job documenting uh, the, um, the island itself. And again, another one, one of the amazing resources you guys have for historic research of this area. These pictures show not only air and boat, but also show how many people are actually coming to the island. As you all well know, Catalina Island still draws, and I'm going to look to Kelly as I say this next sentence, non-COVID years, over a million people come to the island on, on any given year. Is that still accurate, Kelly? Get a little bit of a nod. Got it. Got a nod. There we go. Yay. Good. So here's the stats, 25 miles to Catalina Island. It was a three hour trip. Pitchers and catchers first in mid-February. Uh, and then after a week later, the rest of the team would come in. Scrimmages though, were generally held in Los Angeles. And come, come uh, mid-March, players were already back on the train uh, from LA across the Southwest and then back to Chicago doing pickup games. All in all, 19 Hall of Famers for the Chicago Tubs trained on Catalina Island. I want to pause real quick on this. The trips on the boats were very interesting for the Chicago Cubs in that rookies were pretty much abused by, by players on these, on these boats where they were instructed of all things to find the pool, the billiard room, for example, on a boat going from Catalina to Avalon, where players would be searching all over the boat Rookies not knowing any different, looking for a billiard room on a, on a, on a moving boat uh, is an interesting thing. But really, the real issue was that um, players would get a lot of players who had never been on a boat would get seasick on the boat to the point that the Cubs, Cubs um, uh, you, equipment managers would feed them loads of bacon ahead of time to avoid seasickness. Not sure if that helped or not, but that's what was done. Brings me back to the main question. Was any work really done on the island? Um, I try to add a little bit of humor because the photographic evidence really doesn't show that much. You don't really see as much as you'd like to see because Avalon looks to be a lot of fun. But in reality, there were four hours of workouts every day for the players. There are some uh, really good pictures of, of players actually doing what looks to be baseball out on the island getting ready. Uh, and some beautiful pictures of what would be called the boys of summer out there. But, and it was definitely not all work and no play. I juxtapose this picture up against the postcard because you can still, you can see the line of the mountain and a player using a bat to shoot towards the first base line there. Um, actually, the players got to do a lot of hunting in the afternoons. There were grouse. Um, they got to play with buffalo uh, and amongst other things out on the island. So, Again, more indications that it was just a lot of fun out on the island for these players, uh, which may go to the whole letdown of the Chicago Cubs, essentially from 1938 through 1951, where they only made the they only made the World Series once during that time period. Uh, I don't think you feed um, baseballs, Charlie Grimm, uh, to to leopards, but I guess on Catalina Island it was worthwhile. It's not boring on the island. Uh, beautiful casinos. Um, wives and others wouldn't. Uh, wives and family members would all note um, 
just how much activity there actually was out on the island for ball players. And again, um, having had the opportunity to work with some ball players and meet them, baseball is such a great sport because you get people from all walks of life that weren't really seeing uh, what the world looked like. And William really, really, um, really laid it out for the players uh, to really have an enjoyable life. Nighttime big bands were brought there. In fact, the 30 bungalots that were brought out on the island were actually, the plan was that they'd be used to actually house band members afterwards. So there was an interesting thought process of, of taking in land use. And my, in my real career, I'm a, a lobbyist that used to represent uh, land in, in Illinois and in Chicago. The idea that Wrigley was well ahead of the turn of building units for players and then converting those when the players were gone for other people on the island is a really interesting notion. I, I put this in just out of myself. Cubs are long gone by 1957 out of, out of Catalina. But that view is very reminiscent of the view I saw in one of the nights that I had on Catalina. Um, I, frankly, uh, a few places have taken my heart quicker uh, than Catalina Island. It's just such a stunningly beautiful place. But um, this view is not much different than what players would have seen towards the later end of the Cubs' time on the island. And to be honest with you, um, just to put it out on the table, having uh, been to or, or been to probably two thirds of the stadiums in the in the country, I cannot think of a more beautiful place to play baseball and to see it at night than Catalina. There was baseball on the island, okay? Um, there were scorecards and and player player rosters that were distributed by the Cubs. These are a great legacy of the many years and the itinerary. I do, again, will show you, though, that most of the baseball practice was done on Catalina. The games were played in Los Angeles. Um, again, beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful um, baseball documents um, that uh, – still remain out there. And you can find a lot of these on eBay and things along that line. We can't talk about Catalina Island and the Cubs without mentioning Ronald Reagan. Reagan was a broadcaster for WHO out of beautiful Des Moines, Iowa. Um, and frankly, Reagan would take ticker tape in order to because he wasn't physically at a ball game, he would get ticker tape and would basically create dramatically play by play for fans listening on WH. Oh, there's a great story that um, the ticker tape had broke and they, the signal had broken and Reagan basically recreated a magical at bat that lasted for about 10 minutes only to find out that the guy had struck out at the end of it, but he was able to keep it going. But Reagan, a kid out of Eureka, Illinois and Eureka is, famous for a place called Eureka College. I went to school at Illinois State University as an undergrad and graduate school. Eureka is a small town between Bloomington Normal and Peoria. Beautiful little college, beautiful little private college. But Eureka is in the middle of farmland. Dutch Reagan at that time, that kid wanted to get out of Iowa and wanted to go to California and begged the Cubs for a number of years to be part of the reporter pool. It was a great opportunity to see the world with Chicago Cubs. And finally, the Cubs relented. When the Cubs were able to get him out to California, that's when he took a screen test. Um, he was a graduate of Eureka in 1932. 1937, joins the Cubs in Catalina, lands a screen test with Warner Brothers, his first, his first acting role was playing a radio announcer in Love is in the Air. Then famously went on to play George Gipp and Newt Rockney, All-American if you're a Notre Dame fan. That's a tug, tug at your heartstrings thing, and that's where the whole line, play one for the Gipper comes in and the rest becomes history. My linkage to Ronald Reagan is the same with you guys in that both all of us are hopefully, uh, hopefully at least appreciative, if not all-in Cub fans, but he is also a member of the Emil Verbin Memorial Society. So that's my linkage to Reagan, that we're both members of the Washington, D.C. Chicago Cubs fan club. And Reagan was a diehard Cub fan throughout his entire, um, throughout his entire life. With all things, though, all good things must come to an end. 
Cubs leave Catalina. Um, let, I want to talk very briefly about what, and from a really from a baseball side sideline, what really was happening during that time period. What drove the Cubs to Mesa? The Cubs are, are going to be playing in Mesa, in fact, this afternoon at Sloan Park. What drove them there? It's easy to say times change, transportation change, Major League Baseball change, but it was really the economics of baseball that had really changed. The development of the Citrus and the Cactus Leagues really came up. So Florida and Arizona became the focal point. And getting competition in order to play really relied on having players in a contained situation and setting up leagues. Um, at the same time, Major League Baseball was changing as well because the Pacific Coast League no longer existed. Those teams, teams like the Dodgers, teams like the Giants, came out to the West Coast, thus creating an opportunity to make this game more of a national game. And Mesa offered more than just, just the fact that it was the Cactus League. It offered, and the business people of that community offered a legitimate ballpark, and they built a new economy around it that lasts through to, to today. Um, this is the 1953 spring training uh, a scorecard. If you look at the scorecards I had showed you previously that, that, that Catalina had, which was basically rosters, these look like the scorecards of today. A marketplace was actually put together through Mesa. Hotels were built because of it and other things. In fact, to this day, this is Sloan Park in Mesa. This does not look like Catalina Island's ballpark. This is a full-scale ballpark that truly replicates, including the deep 353 and 355 right and left field corners um, and 400 to straightaway center outfield of Wrigley Field. This looks, feels like the playing surface at Wrigley Field. And as a result, a much bigger, uh, a much bigger infrastructure was put around it. Um, the first ballpark, of course, was Ho-Ho Cam before the Cubs went to Sloan Park in Mesa. But this is the real game changer. Um, this, this, this is where, where rubber hits the road from a baseball standpoint. Spring training throws in almost $400 million into Arizona's economy. Um, that's hard to compete. A small island like Catalina, while beautiful and bucolic and has everything that a person could ever want because it is so beautiful. And there's so much, I, I, I fell in love with Catalina. You can't compete against having all these other teams playing in Arizona close to each other um, and, and what it really brings in. And folks, that's $400 million in less than five weeks' time. That's five weeks' time. Um, 15 uh, Major League Baseball teams now are playing in Arizona, attracting almost 2 million fans. Uh, this article is, uh, is about three years old, but those numbers are – those numbers – stripping away pandemic will indicate what it really looks like. Let's take you back to Catalina. I want to show you what I saw when I was there uh, very quickly. So this is, this is what's left of the third base line of, of Catalina. Now that, that brick wall, that stone wall goes all the way down the third base line. The tree line is still there. Um, I put it to you and I mentioned it when I was in Catalina a couple, a year and a half ago. Um, it's interesting how, how Avalon uses that land, but everything in it says, boy, oh boy, if some creative people came together, you could probably reestablish something pretty special. I know that some of the folks call it a field of dreams out there, but the reestablishment of it would uh, be an interesting thing. But what's interesting is there were enough people at Avalon that said, let's not mess with some of the infrastructure that was put there. Let's keep it there uh, just as a memory. And I know that there is a memorial, there is a, a marker on the island indicating that this happened here. But as a baseball historian and as a person who has put historic markers at different ballparks in Chicago, um, for me, to be honest, it's really sad. Uh, there's nothing sadder to me than an empty ballpark. Um, it just is what it is. I'm a, 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 I'm a lover of the game, but the infrastructure is there, at least for now. Our link and legacy with, the, with Catalina is, is pretty significant. Um, uh, the Catalina Club is one of the things that the Chicago Cubs have put in place. 
and I'm going to show you something that, to, that shows you what warms my heart about it. This is the logo that the Cubs use for the Catalina Club, but this is the view. This is the view that you would also, you would generally see in a lot of marketing material of what people would show you from Wrigley Field. This is the view from the Catalina Club itself. Um, it is the best view of the ballpark. It is sections 419, 420, and 421 in the ballpark directly underneath the press box. I would call it the best view in baseball, un, un, unobstructed across the board. Um, as a longtime Cub fan, as a longtime Cub historian, um, my favorite places in the ballpark to sit to see a game was actually from this vantage point when I was when I would go see a game. Um, now it's the Catalina Club, but this is really the best view in the game. Um, we use uh, Catalina style tile inside the ballpark um, for that section, and it's very reminiscent of the feel of some of the architecture that you would find on the island itself. I'm going to wrap up with what really is a true Catalina legacy, and it's the wind flag itself. Um, the wind flag became pretty popular around the ballpark, really starting in the 1990s, uh, where people would take the wind flag, which is the white flag with the blue W that we have above the scoreboard when the Cubs win. I'm going to take a quick moment here. Um, people would ask where that came from. Essentially, it's a signal flag for us. But if you look upon closer review, it really is from Catalina Island itself. The Wilmington Transportation Company had used that flag as a logo uh, as part of their, uh, for the SS Catalina. And it was Wrigley who thought and built when the scoreboard, PK Wrigley, when the scoreboard was built, he wanted a nautical feel around the ballpark. And that nautical feel got established with bringing the wind flag, a, a W flag out on the ballpark. For the historian, though, in me, it's not historically correct how we have it right now. The original flag was a blue flag with a white base on it. And the Cubs, when they would lose, was a blue flag with a, a, a white L. Um, uh, so it, we, we, um, I would love to see the original wind flag come back up, to be honest with you, because um, it would be that direct linkage. But the wind flag that you guys fly above Catalina is really what the original flag looked like when it would when it came to Wrigley Field. That was changed. Um, it was changed in the '90s, and to strike that in the '80s. Last thing I want to bring to you is um, we often talk at Wrigley Field about the old curse of the Billy Goat, right? That that the idea was that uh, a person who by the name of Sam Sienis brought a Billy, tried to bring a Billy Goat into the World Series and the Cubs ushers at the ballpark said, you can't bring a goat to a ball game. And Sam Sienis' reaction was, sure I can bring a goat. The goat's got a ticket. The usher said, no, you can't bring a goat into Wrigley Field. To which point Sam Sienis basically said, I'm going to put a curse upon you. Now, I'm going to tell you that as an Italian-American, and Italians and Greeks aren't too far off on this, how do you really establish a curse? Now, you have to kind of think about this a little bit. You're going to really curse someone for not bringing, allowing a goat in here. Now, I'm not just a run-of-the-mill researcher, though. So I've lived near or behind or around Greek churches in three different neighborhoods I've lived in in Chicago. In fact, it's a Sunday. If, if the weather was clear, you'd be able to hear the chimes of a Greek Orthodox church that's less than, less than 500 feet from my home. So I went and actually talked to Greek matriarchs. How do you go about putting a curse on this thing? And long story short, the only way you can really truly remove a curse coming from a Greek, first off, you have to assume that Greek person has the power to put a curse on you. But if you do, you actually have to have an exorcism. All said and done, when we won the World Series in 2016, we believe we have put the curse aside. But you still have to reflect on the fact that somebody somewhere may have put a curse on the Cubs in order to make sure that we were not in a World Series from 1945 until 2016 and did not win one from 1908 to 2016. That is a long gap in time, period. Upon a lot of reflection, though, 
I become more and more assured that Sam Cianis, a bar owner in Chicago, and the Billy Goat is still in existence in Chicago. It's a wonderful place. And the Cianis family are wonderful people. Didn't have the power or authority to do it. On the other hand, issues of goats in Catalina Island keep popping up. The car that brought the players from the shoreline to the, club, to the golf course. It's called the goat. You have all these pictures of Charlie, of, 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 uh, of Jolly Charlie and others with a goat. And you start thinking there's got to be some kind of lingature if you're going to wear a tinfoil hat and believe that curses exist and that an animal or some extrapolation of an animal can create a curse. I don't believe the curse started with Sam Sienis, but I am inclined to believe that the curse really happened when the Cubs left Catalina Island, that, that there was such a linkage between Catalina and that generation of players that once the Cubs left the security and beauty of Catalina, there was a huge gap in time when the Cubs were absolutely non, not uncompetitive, non-competitive. And I like to think it was those early years in Mesa. So I would like to think, and it may be worth future review, that the curse of the Billy Goat was not really anything to do with Chicago, but has everything to do with the Cubs leaving Catalina. Um, I wrap with this, that these are some of the pictures of Dawn on Catalina Island. And again, for those of you who live there, you see it all the time. And it's something, but as a Chicagoan who was only out there for a couple of days uh, in order to help the island out. I have to tell you, you are in a beautiful slice of heaven. Watching that, that, that sun rise up over the bay and is really something special. And as a kid from Chicago, a big city kid, to come out to an island, I then started to think about ballplayers seeing some of the same very things, the fountain especially, which has been there a very long time, and the bay. It really is a special place. Um, I did make my way around the island. Everyone knows Lalo. Um, um, unfortunately, the, the one thing about uh, this program is it cropped out the ring, but Lalo, the first World Series ring Lalo got to see of the Cubs was mine. And I'm very pleased I was able to share with him the ring. Uh, what, a wonderful, what a wonderful oral historian Lalo is, and he's a great gift to the island. Um, uh, the views from on top of the Wrigley, uh, the Wrigley Mansion or something. Um, but it should all begin, start and end with um, the museum itself. You have such a special place on the island uh, that's preserving the history of really uh, a vital place that's been uh, the home of everything from sailors to Marilyn Monroe to uh, actresses and actors and, and a play place to what I believe is a wonderful and meaningful home of the Chicago Cubs for so long. And um, I, I, I can say it now because I know he's no longer on the call and he texted me while it, um, I was really honored to have the owner of the Chicago Cubs on this call with you guys today. Tom Ricketts was on the call and he sent me a wonderful text as it wrapped up. But um, I can tell you that the Ricketts family um, has found some of the love that I feel for the island as well. And, um, and, and we, we want to continue to engage with you on it because it's such a vital part of our history. Um, with that all said, my, my first love, while my love is Catalina, my first love is home, and my first love is, is Chicago and the Chicago Cubs. Um, some quick pictures just because um, my wife had to tolerate going through a couple different run-throughs of it, but we did get married um, at the ballpark itself. And um, it's a beautiful place. If folks have questions, I'm, I'm going to be happy to answer, and I think they're going to be screened. But um, if you um, you can follow me on social media, on Twitter, if you want to follow me that way, or if you have specific questions, or more importantly, I think, and again, it's very humbling to talk about Catalina Island to people that are so vested in the island, because ultimately you will have more information than I would ever have. If there's information you want to share, please share it with me and my emails provided folks on the island um, can get me 24 seven and they know that. The view I'm sharing with you while I shared a view of Dawn at Avalon, this is Dawn at Wrigley Field. Um, one of the nice perks I've had at the ballpark was the ability 
to um, be able to go on the ballpark whenever I want. And um, um, there's been nothing more joyful. There's no better place on the planet for me. It's where my my heart heart really resides. Um, is is at Wrigley Field itself, and uh, watching dawn at Wrigley Field is a stunning place. It it really is beautiful. Watching the birds and the squirrels um, play on the field unabetted by players uh, until the until the ballpark wakes up. Not much different than Avalon itself. With that being said and done, if you got questions, I'll take them. So. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to my folks over at, Cat at Catalina. There we go. Thank you. I think everyone else is on mute. Thank you so much, Brian. You can really tell uh, how much you love the Cubs and baseball history. So thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us today. Thank you. Um, we are going to take some questions. Um, so you can let me know in the chat if you have questions. Um, right now, we do have a message from someone special. Seth, if you can go ahead and play the message for us, that would be great. Hi, everybody. It's Pat Hughes, radio announcer for the Chicago Cubs. I am thrilled to be part of the Cubs organization, and I'm always intrigued by their fascinating history. I want to thank Catalina Island Museum for sharing this part of their storied history. Thank you so much. Such a great message. Um, so we have um, some raffle prizes that were donated by uh, John LaFleur over at Island Threads. So I'm gonna do a quick raffle. Um, he has these uh, spring training t-shirts, a hoodie, a hat. Um, so we're gonna raffle those off quickly and then we'll get to the questions. So I'm going to share my screen. So the first raffle prize will be for a men's large t-shirt and hat. So we're going to go ahead and spin the wheel. <laughs> Run out. Congratulations, Ron. Okay, so the next uh, prize is for a ladies medium t-shirt and a coffee cup. Barbara, congratulations, Barbara. Okay, and then the last is for a large hoodie. Okay, so I will be in touch with everybody that won those prizes and we will get to some questions here. Let's see. Okay, so the first one um, is, do you think there's ever an opportunity in the future for the Cubs uh, exhibition game on Catalina Island? So I, I again, I, I'm, I was kind of, Kelly, Kelly's aware of it. And I think she posted in the chat. I'm thinking a lot of people probably weren't looking at the chat during it, but Tom Ricketts, uh, my boss and my friend was on this call. So, um, which was, which was wonderful. So you were on a call with the owner of the Cubs. Um, I, I'll put it this way. Uh, and I, 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 I got to look at Gail because Gail, Gail knows me well enough. I've mentioned it to Gail and to others uh, that I think, I think the Cubs' investment in, in Catalina should be should be looked at in, in one form or another in 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 some kind of symbolic way or some kind of real real way. Um, that's something that I you know I can't speak for the organization, but I have a lot of passion for for the island. I think you guys have an opportunity, to be honest with you, to reestablish that ballpark based on the sight lines and based on what's there for some kind of scrimmage. I would love to see. Um, and I'm looking at Gail as I say this, but I would love to see an opportunity. Um, I, I have a passion for your place. I just, I got to put it out there. And um, I've 
been to many of the baseball meccas across the, across the globe um, in my work with the Cubs and the National Italian American Sports Museum and other places. To me, Cooperstown is a mecca. There's just no other way around it. But what I've often told fans when I give tours at Wrigley Field is Cooperstown is impossible to get to, to as, a, as, a, as a player, practically impossible. And it's almost equally as impossible to get there as a fan. You have to um, you have to fly into Albany or you have to fly into Buffalo and you have to get into a car and there's no hot interstates that get you to Cooperstown. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in Cooperstown where you make a left or a right. And there's a guy who always tells you to make a right when you should make the left. And then you find Cooperstown. And in, in, in its baseball mecca, if you are a true baseball fan, you need to go there because it's just you have to. You're going to the Church of Baseball. As a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame um, and getting to do research there, it's just exactly what you want in every way, shape, and form. But you watch little leaguers, and, and baseball's for kids. I'm a grown-up. I'm an old guy. You know, this is not, you know, I'm not supposed to, you know, be this into this thing that I'm in, but I'm in. But you watch the little guys play and the little girls play. I'm the father of four daughters and one who works in baseball. And I, I get emotional about this. You, you see what a thrill it is for these kids to be able to play at Cooperstown. It's a big deal. To me, I think the opportunity is to do the same at Catalina. That on the East Coast, on the East Coast that you can play from the mountains over, you, you, you want to go to Cooperstown. To me, because of the history, because of the linkage, because of the quaintness of Catalina, I want to be part of anybody that wants to, to take, I think, a modest amount of money and invest it in reestablishing the ballpark on Catalina Island. Um, with as sparse of the infrastructure as you had back in 1921 through 1951 to reestablish that as a place that I think would encourage parents and kids. I can think of nothing better than the sound of kids in cleats walking up the hill, the hills to play on that ball field. Um, and for parents um, from the West Coast over having the op from the West Coast mountain, mountain side over, having the opportunity to be able to have, have their kids play at Catalina and, and really establish that as a place for Little League Baseball. For any of you guys, I, I see there, there are some folks from, um, that have Catalina tours and other stuff on there. Mm -hmm. To me, what's exciting is the, is the fact that the tourism that goes with baseball and touring baseball is big. It's big money. And the opportunity to, and again, I, I speak with a lot of passion about your island. The amount of economic, and, and I, before I was a lobbyist, I was in economic development. What you guys are doing with hotels, what you guys are doing in that area says to me, there's an opportunity to really create it as an opportunity for place. And to make it an annualized thing where you have kids playing at Catalina, where they can learn baseball history, um, where it's a place that West Coast players can can go and do it. And so the answer, long story short, and it's, it probably started as a very innocent question, which is, can we get the Cubs to play over there? I would love to see the opportunity to see the the my the, the Cubs or Ricketts um, invest in 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 the kind of thing that would bring them to that island for something special. And um, again, I'm, I'm in it to win it. Um, I've, to be part of the Cubs since 1998, my passion has been uh, in, in not only in baseball, but preservation of old ballparks. Um, I, I, I just, I, I could talk for an hour about what I see and how that thing could go. Yes. And yes, I, yes. I will do my part to talk to Mr. Ricketts. I will tell you that, that Mr. Ricketts, um, oh, do I want to talk about Chuck Connors? Oh yeah, I I'm I, I can't see all the questions because they're coming in. So oh, I love Chuck Connors. We'll we'll we'll, get, we'll hit it. But <laughs> but but yes, I my if the message from Catalina is Bri, talk to talk to Tom. Yes, and I and if if it's indicative of anything that my boss was willing to take some time, he was on for 45 minutes to hear about it. There should be part of the answer right there for you guys. Good enough. 
So I think we need to wrap up pretty quick here, but let's see, try look, the rest of the see, questions. Be, hold on, let's see what questions, let me help. Okay. Um, let's see, I saw uh, Mr. Johnson's got his hands up. He's, he's you can wave, there he is. I'll show a close up of the ring, sure, absolutely. That sure is nice. It's 108 yeah. diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. Wow. And I do have a follow-up question. Uh, should we put a memorial marker at the location of the very first Wrigley Field? I would love to see that happen. I would love to be part of it, Gail. Uh, that's a note for Gail. I'd love to be part of it. Um, I think the baseball historian to me says we got to measure it out right. We've done that before. Um, reestablishing the home plate. If we're going to do it, let's go all in and, and, and really reestablish it the way it should be. But the answer is yes. Chuck Connors played, uh, played with the Cubs on Catalina Island. One of the few ball players that were also drafted. He also was a Boston Celtic uh, as well. Um, for those of you who don't know who Chuck Connors was, um, I, I only really, there's only a couple Westerns that I really love, but man, I don't think I've ever seen a better father than Chuck Connors on the rifle, man. What a, what a great dad he was. He was a great, he was not a great ball player, but he was a good enough ball player. And yes, he, there are a few pictures of him playing at Catalina. Mr. Johnson, I'm going to answer your question. Give Mr. Johnson an opportunity. Unmute him. I think you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Gary, to ask your question. I can't hear you. No. Let's see. I can't hear you. Can you un He's been so patient, too. We got to hear the question. It's probably the most important thing ever. <laughs> can't hear you, Gary. Can you type it? Let's see if I can unmute him. Oh, interesting. Maybe type your question in the chat. Gary, I promise I'll answer it for you. If you, if you, email, you email me or something, I promise I'll answer it for you. Um, let's see if there's any. Uh, I've got one. Um, it says uh, the Rusex. Failure around me. Okay, I'll, I'll, I can answer that too. Go ahead. Uh, so the Rusex still have a herd of Catalina Island goats. Do you think the Cubs would like to have one? Oh, boy. Um, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I think the answer is no. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, and I, I, I think baseball, I've got, I wish you could see all the Oh, see all the, the W flags. Uh, Gail's going to take pictures. Yes. Thank you. See, that's good. That was, that was an uplift. Um, we actually served goat tacos at the ballpark. Um, it, it, be, before we won the World Series, we actually served goat tacos at the ballpark for a while. Um, I, I don't want to offend the vegetarians or, the, or anyone in PETA. Look, I think the goat, the establishment of the goat was a great narrative and a great, a, a, honestly, a great excuse for the fact that we didn't have good pitching and good catching. That's what it comes down to. But the fact that, but, but um, I like the linkage in the history and to reestablish the idea that the true curse, maybe you guys can market and where's my Catalina Tours person, you know, let's, let's market the fact that maybe this was the true curse and let's make a buck or two off of it. So behind me is just a small portion of my baseball library. Um, in, in my real life, I'm a, I'm a lobbyist, but um, my, I'm, in, I'm in a series of different books on baseball. A lot of those are behind me. Um, you'll see some original pictures of Wrigley Field, and some of them are original artifacts, but um, my baseball memorabilia is pretty extensive. Um, my collection is very arcane. Uh, I collect only really two, two years of baseball history, and it's between 1914 and 1916 of a thing called the Federal League. The Federal League was the league that built Wrigley Field. So I'm, uh, that's where my real passion is. Um, but yeah, my, my wife tolerates this. Well, Brian, thank you so, so much for thank coming to us today from Chicago. Thank uh, you very much.
It was amazing. And everybody, if we did not get to all your questions, please feel free to email them to me and um, I will get them answered for you. Um, or if you took down Brian's email address, you can email him the questions. But thank you everyone for joining us today uh, for our program. Thank you. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Sunday. Go Cubs. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.